Welcome back to Battleship Systems. 16-inch projectiles are the largest shells ever made by the U.S. Navy, and most other navies for that matter. The bigger the projectile, the more damage it can do, and the further it can travel. But these aren't the kind of things you can just take out of your pocket and load into the gun. In this episode, we look at how battleships raise their main battery payload from stowage. Please check the errata page in the description. Battleships aren't like other Navy ships. They're designed to give and take an equal sized projectile that their main batteries can fire. Before and during the war, fears grew that the Japanese would develop an 18-inch gun and overpower even our most modern battleships. That's why the Bureau of Ordnance made a new 16-inch, super-heavy, armor-piercing Mark VIII shell. The idea is that by adding more weight, it would gain more velocity during a line of fall giving it the same deck piercing capacity of an 18 inch armor piercing shell. But you would still need a way to get it all the way up to the gun house. And the thing about super heavy AP shells is that they're super heavy. It takes an awesome amount of force to lift a 2700 pound projectile up 35 feet into the air. There are three projectile hoists in each turret, one for each gun. They are mounted on the working platform which rotates with the turret. The hoistways are only large enough to send one projectile through at a time, and the ones for the left and right guns are curved. The projectiles enter the hoist tubes at either the upper or lower projectile flat. You have to use power buckling equipment to help you slide the projectile into the hoist. As the shells enter, the loading aperture and the shutters close behind, holding it tight. When loading from the upper flat, there's a piece that closes to prevent the projectiles from falling down the hoist. Machinery takes over from this point on. So what actually raises the projectiles? The projectile hoist is a hydraulic ram that pushes the projectiles up in stages. The stroke is actuated by an 8.5 foot high hydraulic cylinder located on the lower projectile flat. Its piston is connected to a crosshead on the upper flat. It's joined to a long assembly of linked steel connecting bars known as the rack. Extending from this rack are a number of pawls that grab onto a small portion of the bottom of the projectile and push it up the tube. But the hydraulic cylinder isn't tall enough to push it all the way to the top of the hoist. The 16 inch projectile makes its way up in stages. The pawl carriers are special in that they're spring loaded. This means that projectiles can pass the pawls if they move in the opposite direction. Not only are there rack pawls, but there are also stationary tube pawls. Through reciprocating movement of the rack, the projectiles raise one level at a time until they reach the top of the hoist. When serving ammunition, the hoist will hold a certain number of rounds in the hoistway. When it's time to cease fire, you don't want to waste all those projectiles by firing them off. And it's not like you can just take the projectiles out of the turret and bring them back down to the flats. That's why the projectile hoist has a lowering mode. So here's the dance. At the bottom of each stage is a rack pawl tripping cam. When the rack is raised, this cam is engaged and the pawl will retract so it doesn't lift the projectile. This cam returns to normal during the top of the stroke. There's also a tube pawl operating system that can retract all the tube pawls at once. This system engages when the projectiles are at the top of the stroke and the rack has already lifted the projectiles slightly above them. This process is repeated until the hoist is empty. Another part of the 16 inch projectile hoist is the cradle. This device sits at the top of the hoistway. The cradle assembly itself is made of cast bronze and it pivots on a fulcrum to point the projectile toward the breech of the gun. This action is commenced by the expansion of a hydraulic cylinder. A similar spanning tray is hinged to the top of the cradle and a control link unfolds it into the gun. These two parts provide a flat surface for ramming the projectile and the powder charges into the gun. And that deserves its own episode. So where does this equipment get the power to move these giant shells? The projectile hoist is powered by two separate systems. One is ran by a 10 horsepower motor and it operates the cradle and the pawl mechanisms. The power drive for the hoist itself is ran by a 60 horsepower motor. 
This isn't a typical hydraulic pump though. It's a variable displacement pump, sometimes called a speed gear. The pump is able to variably generate pressures in both directions. These pumps have an odd number of cylinders placed around a shaft. The pistons are connected to the socket ring. This ring is linked to the shaft by a universal joint and is seated in the tilting box. So by changing the angle of the tilting box, you change the way the pistons act against the valve plate and in effect change the rate or direction of the flow. The control input shaft of this tilting box is connected to shafts and gears that end up at the hoist control. The further you push this handle in either direction, the faster the rack will move. There are a lot of safety considerations needed when lifting 2,700 pound projectiles. The cradle itself is locked in the upright position until someone steps on the foot pedal. That foot pedal won't even depress unless the gun is at the proper loading position and the loader's platform hits this bumper. There are solenoids at the hoist control to prevent it from shifting directions until the movement is complete. This prevents you from inadvertently lowering one projectile onto another. By the way, what's the heaviest thing you ever had to lift by hand? Let us know in the comment section below and don't forget to like and subscribe. For me, it was a copy machine that I had to lift over a door sill and it ended up messing up the door sill pretty bad. Some differences between the 16 inch 45 caliber and the 50 caliber is that the 45 caliber only has four hoist stages, but the 50 calibers of the Iowas need five stages to accommodate for the added height. And instead of the 10 horsepower motor for the cradle and a 60 horsepower for the hoist, the Iowas have a single 75 horsepower motor on the electric deck that runs both pumps. In addition, the older 45 calibers had a safety stop lever and a mechanical interlock system. The sign would show hoist when it's safe to raise another projectile and danger when the cradle is open. This was later replaced with an electric hoist control indicator. Although the Mark 8 armor piercing shell didn't see much action during the war, compared to the 1900 pound high capacity projectiles, it was the answer to the fears that the Japanese were developing an 18 inch gun. It wasn't until after the war that we found out that these fears were indeed justified. In lieu of donations to me, please consider donating to a battleship museum like the Battleship Iowa. There's a link in the description that will bring you to the Pacific Battleship Center website where you can donate to the nonprofit organization. Thanks for watching.